people and power. What a privilege this episode to host uh, the Minister of uh, Science and Technology in the Ugandan government, but of course known for the other side of herself, a veterinarian, a microbiologist, an epidemiologist. I mean, you can talk about all the ologists you know about. I am talking about none other than Honorable Dr. Monica Mosenero joining me on NBS People and Power. What a pleasure to have you right here. Uh, how are you doing? I am doing very well. That's great. And uh, thank you for having me at this beginning of year. Oh, thank you so much for allowing us in your space. And I love the boo-boo. You're, you're taking it on another level, making Uganda best. What inspired your T-shirt, first of all? Um, this T-shirt is inspired by the vision and the ethos that I live, especially mm. in this segment of my life as minister. For science you know when i became minister i was like what do i add to this nation mm. what do what what's my contribution sure and uh, looking around and just appreciating the immense resources in the country we should be standing on top mm. but uh, for some reason we we come around so we set the vision as uh, making uganda we want to see Uganda as the best, most technologically advanced nation in mm. this region, mm. starting with East Africa and then East and Central Africa. Uganda, we want it to be the best. Okay. So, uh, but I've extended it a lot <laughs> to my life <laughs> everywhere. It has go. become part of uh, you. This, no, this, the beauty of this nation, yeah. the resources that are available, the people. I see it, and we just need to polish a little bit with science and technology mm. and to just shine like a diamond. And talking about science and technology and Uganda being the best, I think it's one year now since we launched our first satellite in the orbit. Um, how far are we performing with that satellite? Uh, do, are we getting the information? Probably many Ugandans could have forgotten, but could you just take us back? Because I saw the excitement yes. at the launch and you just couldn't hold back. Uh, yes. Um, the satellite was launched and that was a big milestone. Yeah. It was really a mental, um, a mental unblocking for us of the possibilities that we can do. Agreed. Now, uh, satellites are of different sizes, they are of different functions and different capacities. The satellite we set out was called a Chub satellite. It's a small satellite, actually. Mm. Most people saw the rocket, mm. NASA's rocket. That big, that's a big vehicle. And we thought that, that entire <laughs> thing was the satellite. <laughs> yeah, no, it actually had yeah. three satellites on board. Oh. It had the Uganda satellite, it had the Zimbabwe satellite, and it had one for Japan. And so the, the satellites were launched in space, and we set up our small uh, station on the ground. The lifespan of that satellite in space is 12 months. 12 months? Yes. So should we say it's out now? Because I think we that, are almost that, already... That particular one has deorbited, but we are building the next one. Deorbited means, um, you know, a satellite out there, they are like rings of rods. Like you see these rings, ring rods around the city. Mm. So they are rings. We call them orbits. Mm. So it is put in there and it rotates in a particular orbit. And that orbit helps us, we focus on it to get the information. So when it can no longer perform that purpose, it is moved to another, it moves to an outer orbit where mm, we can't communicate okay. with it. But it gave us a lot of effort, uh, a lot of um, mileage mm -hmm. uh, to, get, to get into the community of space as a nation. Okay. Uh, as a nation. So right now we have um, our engineers very busy and we're also working with the other collaborators. Unfortunately, I can't talk much detail about, about it. the new baby <laughs> until it's the born. new baby. But let's talk about yes. this satellite that has been deorbited. Um, what information did it fulfill? What are its successes? What challenges did we face that we think in the next satellite we will be working on? I think uh, the first one is that this was really a small satellite. Mm -hmm. It was a student project. We sent three engineers to Japan, and this was part of the work that they did. 
So Ugandans had a lot of expectations. But that satellite, for example, couldn't do communication, mm -hmm. like it couldn't do TV, uh, you know, DSTV, the satellite TV. It couldn't do uh, internet, but mm. it takes pictures. It takes pictures, and so we can use the geographical mapping. And uh, we have our center in Impoma. Mm. There's a lot of information there. We were told security information. We were told yes. it's going to give information about whether... Yes, it can. It does. It did. But you know when it comes, then it has to be segmented and it is channeled. So if it gives security information, we're not going to tell it to you. <laughs> the expense. <laughs> the expense of keeping a satellite in the orbit, even when it was just there for 12 months. Tell us about that, because that is one of the things that Ugandans were discussing after we launched. Um, you know, sometimes Ugandans add a lot of salt and uh, <laughs> a lot of spice into something. Mm. As, I, as I said, this satellite was part of a student project. So we paid for three engineers. Actually, I found the uh, former ministry had already sent these engineers out. Mm. And as part of that, they did. That's the money that we spent. And then- The training on. alone? Yeah, the mm -hmm. training alone. Mm -hmm. And then we bought some equipment that we put in Impoma. Okay. So, and, and we didn't fixing. pay for anything for the satellite to be in the no. space, NASA, and no, everything? no, NASA, NASA offered that. Japan offered the testing and everything, and they paid for the launch. Okay, mm. we didn't spend a lot of money on that. About roughly how much did we spend? I in? They have those figures somewhere. Um, total for the students. Uh, just a rough figure because, of course, it can't be the exact one. Mm. Mm. A, a rough figure could be a total of one billion. One billion shillings. Mm. And, and the next Four. one? Uh, the next one will be more expensive. More expensive and mm. we have to foot all the bills as a company. Yes, it is mm. ours. Mm. You know, having a satellite is not a luxury. Because it's like, maybe if, if my grandmother was in the village, having a car is a luxury. But for you... Having a car is not a, it's a necessity. It's a necessity. Yeah. Having a satellite, not just one, multiple satellites, is a necessity. One, it is business. All of you pay for DSTV, mm. don't you? Mm. Yeah. It is business. Okay. And it makes money. Sizable a lot more money than some of the things that we are selling. Uh, recently I visited a country where they actually they have a set of satellites and they provide the satellite services to all these uh, TVs. Okay. And it's a lot of money. Two, uh, it's necessary for you to know your place. Mm. It's, you have, we call it eyes in the space. When you don't have your own satellite, for example, Somebody can come from out and say, I want to buy that land there. Mm. And for you, you are like, why that one? Like, oh, this one is good geographically, we say this. But they know there is gold under from satellite information. Mm. 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 They know there are minerals under. And they will come and sit there and keep you away from doing it. So when you don't have good satellite services, you are not able to know. Other people know about you. They will, somebody will be, a satellite could as well be seeing what we're doing here. Now, we can't stop them from doing that, but we should also be able to Apart. see what they see. Okay. Uh, the third thing is mm. um, the satellite technology is critical for production. You see how we find out about most things when they have happened? Mm. You find out about a, a landslide when it has happened. Satellite gives you that prior. It will give you that information much earlier. Mm -hmm. And you are able to preempt a lot of these things. You know, you'll be able to, to identify these issues. For example, you could be able to identify even weather conditions two, three months before they come. Okay. We will know a drought is coming with the accuracy. And so we plan. We will know that uh, El Nino is coming, but... People will tell you, oh, El Nino is coming, but for you, you don't have accurate information. Okay. Uh, then security. 
you know, security. If you don't have eyes in the space, you always find out security things after they have happened. Mm. But that helps you to know. So, and there's a lot of, we call them space assets. And if you're not part of that community, you don't You're out get entirely. benefit. Just that little satellite, it put us in the community. Okay. Well, yeah. at the prefix of your name is doctor. And for many people, sometimes doctor comes with books. Mm. But I know yours is in the medical field. I know we'll be talking about more and more about the technology side. But where did this career stem from? Because I know that you could have started out as a teaching assistant after Makere University, that is in the Department of Veterinary Medicine. And then the switch, we'll be talking about the switch to politics and how that did come through. But tell us how your career started. Uh, uh, my career started, I'm a veterinary doctor. Mm -hmm. I'm trained uh, as a veterinary doctor. So that's where my doctor comes from. Mm. Now, you guys, those years when we went to university, we had one university in the Makerere. country. Makerere. Makerere, the campus. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you just say the campus and everybody yeah. knew where you were going. Okay. But they used to take in 1,000 students annually. That was it. That was the cap. So they would take a few for this, a few for this, a few for this. So my ambition was to be a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a medical doctor. You wanted to treat people? Yes, actually, specifically children. Oh, so yeah. you wanted to be a pediatrician? Yes. Oh. Well, I'm happy I didn't <laughs> get that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, as, a, as a young, you know, but I loved science so much. Okay. Uh, by my senior one in secondary school, they were calling me doctor. Oh. Yeah, because... If I got 98% in chemistry, I would be so sad. You wanted to cap it 100%? Yeah, 100 and give a little bit more. Such that <laughs> you have no, the teacher will not say, mm -hmm, Yeah, they, you don't they have to this. go and find the, that additional information oh. and learn something. I just love science. When science comes naturally, it's, a, it's the beauty of nature, the beauty of creation. So I just understood very early how to understand science. Mm. And so by the time I got to university, at that time, of course, everybody wanted to do, I really wanted to do medicine, okay. but I was given veterinary medicine. Wasn't that a disappointment from it people was. to animals? It was, <laughs> it was. Besides, hmm. up to that time, I'd never seen a veterinary doctor. Oh, really? <laughs> there were none in... None. So I, I reluctantly went for veterinary medicine, really. Okay. And, but after the first year, hmm. I fell in love with the level of science in it. Okay. I just fell in love. I remember my lecturers um, because I literally, they, they couldn't believe they had a student like this because they hadn't had one. Would get A's and A plus and what in veterinary medicine. Veterinary medicine was known like the impossible course. Mm. So I remember in one of my uh, oral exams, they asked me, should we send you to medical school? I said, no. I want to stay here. He said, Are you oh, they, sure? they were thinking about switching you back to yeah, your original... Yeah, they were, uh, yeah. They, but by that time... You had fallen in love I'd with I'd fallen in love and mm. I'd got a different passion. <laughs> I'd got another passion. Mm. Um, so my passion... I, I don't know if it was another passion, or just the same passion expressed differently. Mm. Uh, that uh, I love to help people who are, who are vulnerable. And to me, growing up, children looked so vulnerable. Mm. And as, as, a, as a pediatrician, I wanted to help. And then when I came to veterinary medicine... You realized that the creatures were more vulnerable. They were not the animals. Mm. Actually, it was the veterinary students oh. that I felt. And that's what drove me to become, to get to become staff. The course was horrible. Not because it was tough, but the people they are in there made life extremely difficult. And there were people like me. I had come from a very rural area. I had mm. struggled, paying fees. It was a miracle that I'd reached here. And that was a hope not only for me, yeah. but for my entire family and my entire village. But these guys were so happy to discontinue students. 
and the treatment, the way they would treat the students, especially the girl child. You know, there, there was so much harassment. And uh, even the boys, you know, a lecturer would come and tell you, you're ugly, openly in class. You know, and the psychological and the emotion, there was no customer care. Actually, in my first class, in my very first class in veterinary school, on a Monday morning at around 8.15, I decided I was going to become a lecturer. I was going to pass this course, and I was going to become a lecturer in this faculty, and I will change the way. So, so when you finished school, Student. did you apply to come back as a lecturer, or were yes. you selected no, because of well, your grades? No, I, when I finished, I had done so well that literally every department wanted me to join them. But I'd work towards it because I wanted to have choice on where I go to teach. Mm. So I could have taught in anywhere. But then I zeroed on this department where students were most treated poorly. And I started to teach. But, but come to think of it, you're in university, you're pursuing your degree. Not everyone at that point in time would get a degree. Mm -hmm. And you were thinking about teaching already? Because someone yeah. would be thinking, I want to go to a government, parastate or something like that and work. For you teaching, no, where I, did that come from? I, I, it's not because I wanted to teach. It's because I wanted to be in a position that supports the vulnerable to change, to change it. Mm. And that's what drives me. That's wow. really up to now. That's what drives me.